fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Amen. That's what we want God to do today. Feed us with the bread of life. Again, it's a joy and it's a privilege to stand before you this morning. Amen. I do not take this responsibility lightly. Amen. And uh, just a little humor this morning for the funny ball. Amen. I know a few of you can show up for the jokes. <laughs> I know this because when I don't tell a joke, y'all don't freak by. <laughs>
that vision that happens when there's something in your eye. And uh, I, I got a lot of comments about the sermon on last Sunday, and, and maybe we can have a log cabin service at some point in the future, amen. There was a number of folks told me they need to get the log out of their eye before they can help their sister or their brother <laughs> get the speck out of theirs. And, and maybe we can have a log cabin service, amen, where we work on getting the log out of our eyes. Amen. Uh, but this morning, I want to close out this series, if it be the Lord's will. Now, next couple of Sundays, God may give me something else. But this morning, I want to wrap up this series looking at clear vision. Clear vision. Clear vision. You see, clear vision is properly seeing things as they really are. Seeing things as they really are. And, and clear vision is, is really what we all desire, amen? Yes. I, I can say this because clear vision is why we buy the glasses, it's why we buy the contacts, it's why we get the LASIK vision, huh? Because we all want to see clear. And so this morning I want to unpack if you will, these four verses so that we might see clearly. Please, please pause before word of prayer. Oh God, our Father, I pray now that you would use the remaining time for the preaching of your word, that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Oh God, in the heart of open understanding, Pull your word into our heart that it might manifest in our life and that we would be the people you called us to be. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Clear vision. I I, 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 I really want you to listen today. And this is not that you don't always listen, but I really want you to listen today because one of the few things that concerns me deeply as a pastor is that you would come and listen to me Sunday after Sunday and still remain lost in your sins. I realize that I can't save anyone. I can only point you to Christ through the preaching of his word. And I hope over the last seven years as I closing on completing my seventh year here as your pastor. I hope I have been, been real and I hope I have truly pointed you to Jesus Christ. Amen. But what would trouble me is after sitting under my teaching and my preaching for seven years, is that someone would still be lost. And the text this morning is dealing with this very thing. Because Jesus is speaking now to a Jewish crowd. And He's speaking to this Jewish crowd and he's speaking to the Jewish leaders in particular. And he's addressing their concern about giving them yet another sign. See, in spite of all of their 
uh, that they've seen. They've seen his teaching. I mean, they heard his teaching that was phenomenal. The Bible says that he taught like one with authority. They've seen his miracles. The changing of water to wine. The healing of those that are sick. The restoring of sight to the blind. Restoring of, of hearing to those who are deaf. They even seen him raise dead people and bring them back to life. And yet, in spite of all of that, they keep asking him to show them yet something else that might prove that he is the Son of God. And, and, and he's not teaching, I mean, he's not talking here to, 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 to wayward folks. He's not talking to folks that are just out and about on the street. He's talking to church folks. People who know the law, who know the word of God, who read it, studied, showed up in Sunday school, showed up in Bible study, can quote it, amen? And yet, they continue to ask for a sign. And they have gone so far as to accuse him of doing the things that he does because he is a saint. They say, they say, you do these things because you, 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 you are partners with Satan. And, and, and so Jesus said, wait a minute. Do you not know that a house divided cannot stand? So if I'm doing the work of Satan, why would I cast out demons? Why would I deliver people from bondage if I'm working with Satan? And because they, they, they couldn't connect the dots, amen, and, and, and so they would go around, the leaders would go around, and they would shape and poison the thoughts of the people to where everybody was still asking the question, who are you? And if you really are who you claim to be, then you need to give us a sign. We talked about clear vision this morning. And so, right before verse 33, in, in, in verses uh, 29 to 32, Jesus says this. He says, uh, this wicked generation, you wicked generation, the only sign that you are going to get is the sign of Jonah. The only sign that I'm going to give you is going to be the sign of Jonah. And what Jesus was saying there, he had already said earlier in Matthew 12 and 40, when he says that just as Jonah spent three days in the well of the fish, so the Son of Man must spend three days in the earth. In other words, what Jesus was telling these individuals, these church folks that he was talking to, he said that you've seen everything you've seen and yet you refuse to believe. So the only other sign that I'm going to give you is my resurrection. The only other sign that you will see of me is my resurrection. Because he was only now a week or two from going to the cross. And so he, he goes on in, in the, those verses and he says to them, he says, listen, you know, you know of Solomon because I know you studied the word of God. But I know you studied the book of Moses and you, you know of Solomon and how Solomon and all of his wisdom uh, that people from all over the world came to see Solomon. 
because of his wisdom. But there is one that is here standing in front of you who is greater than Solomon. In other words, you are looking at the one who has the ultimate wisdom. And yet, you ask for a sign. He goes on to say, I know you, you, you're familiar with the story of Jonah, and you, you, you know the story that Jonah, that he was swallowed by a fish, and, and, and that ultimately the fish, uh, you know, vomited him up on land after three days. But there's one that's standing in front of you that's greater than Jonah. I am the ultimate resuscitator of life. And yet, and yet, you keep saying, show me just one more thing before I truly believe. And so, Jesus now began to use as a metaphor light and darkness, light and darkness to make his point. Because what, what, he, what he really wants them to understand is that in both the physical world and in the spiritual world, it is light that reveals and it is darkness that conceals. You hear what I'm saying? Think about it for a minute. In the physical world, it is light that reveals. We can see things by day, can't we? But it is darkness that conceals. When it is night, it is hard to see. And when it's country night, amen, it's almost impossible to see. <laughs> see, I grew up in, in the country, amen. You didn't have much light. You didn't have those city lights, the city posts. And the only thing that you would see in the black of night every now and then is you would see the little, little, little bugs that had the little light on the tail that way. We call them light bugs, that's right. <laughs> we would capture them and put them in a jar. Amen. But Jesus makes a point here, and his point is that it is light that reveals and darkness that conceals. And so what he's trying to get his audience to understand, and he's still trying to get his audience today to understand here, is that it's not lack of light that is the problem, but it's lack of sight. It is not lack of light, but it is lack of sight. You see, because light exists. Light exists. Light has always existed. But just because light exists does not mean you can see. It's light outside right now. But if you close your eyes, you won't see a thing. So it's, the problem is not light. The problem is sight. Do you clearly see? Do you clearly see? And so, what, what he's saying here is that in spite of all that I've shown you, in spite of all that you've seen with your natural eyes, you still willfully refuse to see the truth. So if you're in darkness, the problem is not that there is no light. The problem is that there is no sight. And so, John 3.19 says this, it says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. 
men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And, and I told you, Jesus is talking to a crowd here, and, and, and he's not talking to a crowd that's, that's caught up in what we would call, you know, the traditional sins that we kind of associate people with. We're not talking about the sins of, of, of immorality. We're not talking about the sleeping around, the running around, the, the cheating and all of that. These are folks that they know the law and they keep the law according to their standards. And so their sin is the sin of self-righteousness. That sin of, of, of that I'm going to define religion by my own standards. That I'm going to define who you are by my belief system and not your belief system, Jesus. And, and, and do you know it's the sin of self-righteousness that is probably the most difficult sin to be delivered from. See, because when you caught up in sins of, of immorality, amen, you know, you know you're wrong. Amen, somebody. I'll say amen myself. But it, huh? When I'm doing wrong, huh? I know I'm doing wrong. I know it ain't right. But when you're caught up in the sin of self-righteousness, you have so convinced yourself that you are right and you don't need to change. Because you have put that flavor and you put that twist on it called Christianese. <laughs> huh? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You can put that twist on it called Christianese. It's that language, that church language. The these and the thou's. And those thus says the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. He is so worthy. And I am so worthy. So because of the Christianese that we have put on our religion, it is a self-righteous religion that convinces us that we don't need to change because we are already saved. And this is what Jesus is addressing to this crowd who's gathered, who once again is asking him, Lord, just show us a sign if you are really the Son of God. Because right now, in our own religion, we ain't buying it. And so I want to quickly hear, I want to quickly hear you use uh, what I call the four P's. The four P's of clear vision. The four P's of clear vision. The four P's of position. Position of light. The problem of sight. The pretense of sight. And the providence of sight. The position of light. The problem of sight. The pretense of sight and the provision of sight. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 33. In verse 33, he says, No one lights a candle and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. So the first point I want to make here as it relates to positional light is that clear vision requires the proper placement of light. Clear vision requires the proper placement of light. See, what Jesus says here is that no one hide, lights a, a, a light and then hides it or put it under a cover. Now think about it. That makes so much sense, right, Sister Jean? We, 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 don't, we don't, you know, back in the day, you know, we, we don't deal with this today that much, you know, but back in the day in the country, man, we had candles and we had lanterns. See? I know y'all don't know anything about that. Let me tell you, a lantern is that thing that you put a little oil in. It's got a little wick, huh? 
and then you light that thing when it starts getting dark because you ain't got no power. Mm -hmm. You ain't got no power in your house because you're too far in the country. They working, they still working their way out to you. That's what my mom and dad used to tell me. They still working their way out to us, right? <laughs> And so, so you would have these lanterns, or you would have candles that you would light when it started getting dark, and, and you would move them from room to room so that you could sleep. And now we've been blessed to have mountain lights in our home. But when you walk into a dark room, you don't walk into the dark room, turn on the light at night, and then get up there and take the bulb out and put it underneath the pillow, do you? <laughs> Brother Bill, if you do that at all, you need to have a conversation. <laughs> the point that Jesus is making is that we turn on light so that light may reveal those things that we cannot see in the dark. And so what he's saying is that when you have the light, amen, that you want to position the light so that it brings the most value. And putting the light under a bushel, under a bucket, putting the light under something to cover it is doing no good to anybody. And so Jesus is saying that the position of the light, it matters. It matters. And what he's really trying to let them know is that God has already set the light. He said that I am the light of the world. And so God has sent the light and God has placed the light so that the light has maximum value to all of those that need to see it. Y'all stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this here. Amen. Don't go to sleep on me yet. See, because people, people need to understand that light has already come. So it's not light that is the problem. If we are still lost, if we are still blind, if we are still confused, it's not because there is no light. God has sent the light. And God has placed the light so that the light will reveal everything. And when Jesus came, he revealed everything. He revealed the sin that was in man's heart. He revealed the plan of salvation. He revealed the remedy for blindness and darkness. So God has placed the light strategically so that we can say, well, the problem is we ain't got no light around here. Because the light is all around. And so, as it relates to clear vision, it's all about the proper placement of the light. And God has done that. He placed Jesus so that the whole world would strategically see. See into the darkness. See their sin problem. See the solution to their sin problem. See the the salvation that they can gain. And Jesus says, if I be lifted up, if I be the light that's put on the light pole, huh, I will draw all men, all of those people in darkness, when they see the light, they will be drawn to the light. And so we have our first position. The second thing that we see here is in verse 34. We say the light's already been placed. But in verse 34, Jesus goes on and he says, Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, 
Your whole body is also full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. So this is the problem. And it's not a problem of light, but it's a problem of sight. Because in these verses, what Jesus is saying, he says, your eye is the lamp of your body. Your eye is the lamp of your body. That doesn't mean that your eye, it, 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 that it is the light. It's not that your eye is the light, but your eye is the organ, organ, amen, by which light enters into the body. It is our eyes that allows light to come in and when light comes in through the eye, then our mind and our hearts can process that which we see. So, so, so he says, the, the problem is not light, the problem is sight. And, and so your eye is the, the gateway into your mind and into your heart. And But he says that if your eye is right, if your eye is healthy, oh, I know you know this, right? If your eye is healthy, then your vision is healthy, then you can see clear. But if your eye is unhealthy, then your whole body has got a problem. Because of an unhealthy eye, you are still in darkness. And so what he's really telling them and what he's speaking to us today that is all about your eye. And when our eyes are clear, when we have clear vision, the whole body is full of, of light. And when we have unhealthy eyes, the whole body is full of darkness. It's full of darkness. And so the problem again, he's saying, the problem is not the light. The light is not the issue here. The light is the eye. It's the sight. What are you seeing? When our eyes are unhealthy, they are clouded by sin. And when our eyes are clouded by sin, then by default, the whole body is sinful. But then he, he then gets to the real meat of the matter after he, he says, you know, first you've got to understand that, you know, it's the proper placement of light. And when you've got the proper placement of light, you don't have a problem with light anymore. So if you don't have a problem with light, but you still can't see, then the problem must be sight and not light. And he says, well, you, 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 it could be that you have unhealthy eyes. But then he goes on in verse 35. And, and then he really gets to the meat of the matter. He says, see to it then that the light within you is not darkness. See to it that the light within you is not darkness. He, what he's really saying here, now pay attention here. You've got to look at this thing and determine if you are in darkness because of the pretense of light. Now, all of us probably have done this. You know when you go to the eye doctor and then they make you back up. Now this is after they didn't get that little puff thing in your eye when you look at the little, you know, the little balloon up in the air. Right? <laughs> and they puff your eye, right? And then, and then they give you this test, and they make you stand so far back, and then they ask the question, okay, uh, tell us what line can you see? Yeah. <laughs> and how many of you know that that chart never changes? Y'all know that chart never changes. And so if you memorize the chart, <laughs> because here's the crazy thing, we go to the eye doctor, right, to get an eye exam, to tell us how bad our eyes are, but we really don't want to be embarrassed by the doctor telling us, oh, you blind and can't see. So we start kind of guessing, right? We start kind of slanting our eyes and tilting our head, right? <laughs> we try to get as close to that 2020 line as possible because it's embarrassing, right? When the only letter you can see is that big E. I promise you. I promise you. 
The next time you go to the eye doctor, I promise you the top letter is E. And, and, and so they are asking you to tell you know tell me what line can you read? And, and we are struggling, right? Because <laughs> we don't want to be honest. So we start trying to slant. We try to try to remember what was that line before? Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, e. <laughs> In other words, we're at the eye doctor, but we are pretending to see better than we can really see. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And so what Jesus is saying is that, that your problem with your sight is that you are pretending to see when you really can. You are pretending to see when you really can. And you're pretending to see because of your own self-righteousness. And so it is your own self-righteousness that refuses to acknowledge that you're in darkness. And this is what happens in church every Sunday. We have figured out the game. We know what to say. We know when to say it. We know where to sit. We know what to sing. We know how to pray. We know how to do all of these things because we have learned church. And so we are pretending to be saved when in reality we are not. And here's the real danger. Some of us have been pretending for so long that we have fooled our very own selves. <coughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? We have been playing church for so long that we have even convinced our very own selves that we are saved. But yet everything about what we do is works. And so Jesus is saying, he, he said here, is that it's, it, the problem is pretense. Pretense of sight. You, 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 you're acting like you can see, but you really can't. And, 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 and here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Satan, Satan, he comes as an angel of light. Did y'all get that? Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So his biggest weapon is that he deceives us because he looks like the truth, but he really isn't. But we buy into it. We buy into it. And, and, and let me say this to young folks. I, I got to say this to young people today because I'm starting to hear this more and more. Okay, young people. See, see this is this is this is how how religion takes place. Young people they leave the church when they get of age. They they leave the church because they say I don't want to have nothing to do with them church folks anymore, and I don't need to go to church to experience God. That's what they're seeing these days. I don't need to go to church to experience God. And therefore, I ain't going to church no more. I can find God everywhere. Well, the truth of the matter is you're absolutely right. You can find God everywhere because God is everywhere. But here's the thing. When you find him everywhere, wherever you find him, the one thing that I know for sure is that when you find him, the only way you're going to get to him is that you've got to go through Jesus. You hear what I'm saying, young people? The only way, when you find him out there in the streets, the only way you're going to get to him is that you still got to go through Jesus. Because Jesus says that I'm the only way. Now, now, here's the problem with that. You find God out there, you still got to go through Jesus. But this is what Jesus said. Jesus says that, Peter, who do men say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Jesus responds to that. Peter, it's upon that truth that I'm going to build my church. Y'all hear what I'm saying? He said, it's upon the truth that I am the Son of God that I'm going to build my church. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So church ain't man's idea. 
church is Jesus' idea. Amen. So when you say that you ain't going to church because you can find Jesus out there, what you're really saying is, Jesus ain't interested in doing it your way. I don't need the church to have a relationship with God. Well, Jesus said that I established the church. And it is through the context of church that my work is going to be done. And he said the church is the body of Christ. We've been looking at this in Bible study, right? The church is the body of Christ, so therefore it is the church through which we are able to accomplish the things that Jesus wants us to accomplish. Now he said the church, the church is like the body. It's made up of many members. Young people, I want to ask you this question. The church is made up of many members. But you don't want to have nothing to do with the church. Now tell me this. If you were to cut off your finger, which is a member of your body, and you were to lay it on this pulpit, when you come back next week, do you think that finger's going to be any good? <laughs> My point is, the finger has been detached from the body, and it's when you detach a member of the body from the body, it's only a matter in a short matter of time before that dismemberment is no longer good for anything. So when you say that you out there and you're trying to do your thing and you don't need the church, you're like that finger that's laid on the altar, detached from the body, and it will soon wither and die. To be a member of the body, you've got to be attached to the body. Now, I know you say church folks get on your nerve. Every now and then they get on my nerve too. Amen. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> I know you say them church folks get on your nerve. But I promise you that every now and then there are members of your own body that get on your nerve. Every now and then your head hurt, your toe hurt, your back hurt. But you don't get rid of them. You go to the doctor and you get a cure for it. Amen? Amen. So the church is nothing but it's made up of folks that's got issues, they got problems, they got ups, they got down, they get on your nerve, but that doesn't mean that you discard them, that you walk away from them. That just means that we all need a healing from Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so the problem here, amen, and I, I need to rush on and close here. I know y'all getting sleepy on me. Is that what Jesus is saying here is that clear vision is hampered by religion. Clear vision is hampered by religion. Because it's religion that causes us to remain in blindness because of our own self-righteousness. We got all these religions of the world. And they all are trying to find their way to God. And they all are trying to do it their own way. When God, in his holy word, has prescribed the way to have a relationship with him. And so if you're taking the attitude that you don't want to do it the Bible's way, what you're really saying is, God, I'm really not answering your way of doing it because I already figured that out myself. And you, my sister or my brother, are still in darkness. And you've been trying to do it this way for so long that you are blind and you don't even know that you're blind anymore. But hallelujah, let me give you the fourth point because this is the glory of it all. He goes on in verse 36 and he says, Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be just as full of light as when a light shines its light on you. Oh my goodness, now I don't want y'all to miss this because this is the providence. This is the providence of sight. What Jesus is really saying here is that clear vision leads to the fullness of the gospel. Clear vision leads to the fullness of the gospel. What Jesus is saying here is that if your whole body is full of light, and there's no darkness in it at all, it would be just as full of light as when a lamp shines in the light on you. What we have here is the, 
the full revelation of truth when we are saved. Now somebody ought to get happy here. When we are saved, God just doesn't give us a little bit of light. But we got access to the fullness of light. When we are saved, amen, and, and the darkness, it's go, it goes away, amen, and our eyes are open so that we can truly see that Jesus is the Son of God, and then we surrender our hearts to him. When we surrender our heart to him, he comes in with the fullness of salvation, not just a little bit, not just an any bit, but the fullness of salvation. We are saved from that moment on, and through the presence of the Holy Spirit, we now have access to all of God's life. Nothing in God's word is ever hidden from us. If you don't understand something in God's word, it's because you're leaning to your own understanding and not activating the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God that is in you, that the Bible says knows the mind of God, which means that the Holy Spirit knows everything that God meant by what he said in his word, and we have access to that. This is why he said he will, he will bless those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. If you really want to know what God meant, what God said, all you got to do is search his word with purpose of heart, brother Pete. I'm not talking about falling asleep trying to read his word like we do. I'm not talking about trying to get a quick read in while we driving down I-64. I'm talking about diligently studying the word of God, rightly dividing the truth. If you are hungry to know about God and you are a child of God, you got access to all the light. He hides nothing from his children. This is the providence of sight, that he opens our eyes so that we can truly see, we can clearly see. And if you are lost in darkness today, if you are lost in darkness today, your problem is not light. Your problem is sight. And so my closing question is this. You heard about Jesus. And I know you've heard about Jesus over the last seven years. So my question to you today is what else does Jesus have to do before you decide to give your life? He then came he didn't walk and talk and preach. He's performed miracles. He went to a cross, died for your sins, then displayed ultimate power by getting up from the grave on the third day. Walked around, was a witness to over. 40 individuals that he was back from the grave. Then he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And so the person on the table is, what else does he have to do before you really make a decision about whether you're going to surrender to him? Because the thing is, when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, when he gave up the ghost, the scripture says, when he hung that cross and died, his last three words were, it is finished. In other words, the plan of salvation, that it's done. There's nothing else left for Jesus to do. He ain't going to show up and do backslips for you. You simply got to read the text. Do I believe that he's the son of God who can save me from my sins or will I remain in my darkness? And it will be a day of tremendous sadness if you 
have to stand before God on that day. After spending all of this time in church, you might well have been playing golf down at Walmart somewhere, but after spending all this time in church, to stand before God and hear him say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you because you chose to remain in darkness. So that is the question. Clear vision. Clearly seeing things as they really are. If you receive that today, give God a
fall down on your knees and thank God for the gift of salvation. Thank Him for the gift that He's placed within you. If you prayed it, God heard you and God will honor you. And just give Him the praise and the glory. And He will give you the strength to talk to somebody and tell somebody that I really got saved on this third Sunday in March 2019. If you're here today and you want to become a member of this church, I want to quickly throw out the lifeline. If you want to become a member of this church, we now extend the invitation of membership. If someone would like to know more about what it means, what it takes to be a member here, just raise your hand so that we can capture your name and, and get with you to give you that additional information. Is there one? Is there one? Amen. Well, I trust that all hearts and minds are clear. I know y'all looking at your watch now. And you're hungry. You think the food's going to get cold over that next door. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I, I, I know I went a little long. I don't apologize for the word of God, but we, our intent was not to inconvenience you. But this is important. This is a matter of life and death. People are dying, folks. Those 50 plus folks that were in that, uh, that more did not know that that day was going to be their last day. But it was. Yes. And this is real. No one knows when we're going to die. But for sure, the Bible says we all are going to die. Yes. But what you do want to know is that when you die, you have made preparations. Yes. And so I, 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 I wanted to spend time here because I do not want you to stand before God and have not been ready for that day. Praise God. Thank you, Brother JJ, for being our worship leader this morning. As always, young man, you are just growing in your, your knowledge of God and uh, your availability of God, and we thank you for that. What's our going home? Close with you.